journey. Happy Sunday. We're going to start the morning off with worship. Will you guys stand and sing with us?
Can you guys feel it this morning? God's going to do something today. God is at work. Well, hey, before you take a seat, turn and meet somebody that you don't know. Well, good morning and welcome to Journey. Uh, hopefully you got an extra, well, you, you did get an extra hour of sleep. Hopefully, it, I know like my kids didn't care that it was daylight savings. They just came in at an hour earlier, it felt like. So anyways, well, hey, welcome. My name is Nolan Lee. I'm the creative arts and executive pastor. And if you're just coming into this thing, you're just walking into Journey, we want to invite you to kind of like a, a welcome lunch that we are going to have today. Uh, at 1230 in the Plaza Room, so after our morning services. We call this First Step, and it's a catered lunch. It's also an awesome opportunity for you to get connected into community and also get to answer, uh, or we will answer some of those questions that you may have about what this church is all about. So I want to invite you, maybe after the service, go and you know get a coffee or breakfast and come back for the Plaza Room. Well, hey, I have a few announcements for us this morning. The first one is on November 14th. We have a blood drive coming up, and I'm going to invite up Terry, Terry Kohlenberg, because this one, this one's kind of uh, personal. I mean, they all, if you've ever had a loved one in the hospital getting a procedure, you know the value of a blood drive. But today, um, we're going to get to hear from Terry because all of what we're doing is going to be going to Mark Kohlenberg, which is Terry's son. So I asked Terry to come up here and share uh, just kind of an update and then a few words, too, I think, that Mark wanted to pass on. So can we give it up for Terry? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Mark's dad, and I use that title because when I think of that title, I am reminded that Mark needs a little more love from me right now, a little more support and care. On August 30th, uh, Mark drove himself to the hospital. He had some a shortness of breath, um, and his legs started to swell, and he's like, I don't know what's going on, maybe I asthma or something. Uh, went in to Sharp Hospital. Uh, They did some blood tests on him. They said, we want you to stay tonight. And um, so he and his wife were there, Tori. And they said, okay. And then the next morning, Tori told us that the doctor wants to have a family meeting that night. And uh, I think we all know what that means when you say a family meeting. And so uh, we had to wait until that evening around 6. I'm at home with my wife. We have Finn, their son, two-year-old son. My other kids are at their houses. We've all got our phones out. Tori has her phone out at the hospital, and the doctor, through a thick accent, says uh, he has leukemia. And, I, and right at that time, Finney started to do, he found, we were outside playing around, he, he found a horn to a bike, and he started honking this horn. And I was going, Finney, yeah, hang on a second. And you know, just things started to spin a little bit. I'm going, I said to Julie, I'm whispering, did he say leukemia? Yeah, hey, can't be leukemia. And the horn's going off, and we can't hear him very well. And um, and then we started to settle in. He, he did. He said he said leukemia. And uh, then he stayed at Sharp Hospital for a week and was transferred to UCSD. Stayed there for three more weeks. Started chemo immediately, and um, and just turned his life, Tori's life, Finney's life, our life upside down. Um, but, uh, but he heard that you were praying for him. Uh, their church was praying for him. Our small group was praying for him. And he and Tori were just overwhelmed with gratitude for, uh, for all of you uh, and just supporting him. After a month, he was there. We had prayed that he would go into remission, and he went into remission. Oh, which is, yeah, amazing, right? Yeah, amazing. Amazing. I, I know that our small group uh, prayed for him that he would get a chance to go home if his blood levels were good enough and he had a chance to go home. At least a day before, they said he might get a chance to go home. Uh, he's now an outpatient. Right? And if any of you are familiar with, uh, with leukemia, you know it's a long road, right? It's a long road. Uh, so he's got a, a, the remainder of a year, about eight months of intense chemotherapy, 
uh, and blood transfusions. He's already had over 15 blood transfusions or, or blood kinds of like platelets, that kind of thing. And he's going to need many more over this next year. The goal is to keep him in remission. So it was explained to me, is like they give you this chemo and it like takes you down and it wipes out your immunity. Your immunity. There are times you can't go out anywhere. And then they try to build you back up through blood donations. And, and, they, and then they hope that at some point your own blood is going to be working on its own. But for this next year, it's going to be very, very difficult. And, uh, and when I told Mark and Tori that our church is having a, uh, a blood drive and it's in his name, uh, they were just unspeakable in uh, the gratefulness that they have for you, knowing that there's not, not just our family, but our community has come together for his support. And so I'm grateful that you would take the opportunity to give blood in his name. And again, thank you so much on behalf of Mark and Tori and Finn uh, for your generosity and your kindness. If, if you've ever wondered if giving blood makes a difference, obviously it does. So I want to encourage everyone, go and sign up. The links um, should be popping up behind me for the details. You can also always go to the welcome table for sign up. Well, hey, we have another thing coming up. Uh, Thanksgiving, obviously, is coming up for all of us. And this can be a really exciting time, but it can also be a stressful time for some of us, right, financially. And so we just want to cue this up. If you are struggling, if you are in a hard place and you might struggle to be able to provide a Thanksgiving meal, we would love as a church to come around you and provide that with all the fixings, all the good stuff. So you can sign up, uh, just take a screenshot of this, uh, that little website there, or also to come talk to one of us pastors, we can help you sign up for that. Well, our last announcement um, is the Christmas tea coming up. Where are the ladies at? Yeah. The Christmas tea is this awesome opportunity to get into the Christmas spirit, um, also to, to invite friends to this. It's kind of a low-hanging fruit, and even for the guys, it's a great opportunity for us to serve. It's going to be on December 7th, uh, which is a Tuesday from 6.30 to 8.30, and I've heard that there's going to be a smoking hot speaker there. It's my wife, <laughs> so I can say that, I can say it. Um, but make sure if you, if you want to host a table, this weekend and next weekend is the weekend to do that. And then the following weekend is when all general tickets will go on sale. So make sure you sign up for that. Go um, out after service and tickets are going to be on sale there. So the last thing I just want to say before we get ready for this week's message is now is the time of the service where we participate in generosity. And, and generosity is something that Jesus did, demonstrated, and lived in his entirety of his life. And we are also called and invited into this. So this isn't like an obligation thing as we receive the offering. This isn't like an arm twisting. It's rather just something that we do and God takes our gifts and he blesses the community through that. And so as you guys uh, do that, we're going to also to get ready for our brand new series, which is Countercultural. So you can also take out your outline or your app and get ready for our brand new series. Hola. <clears throat> Anybody else uh, feel like praying for Mark right now? Anybody else up for that? So uh, just, just, to, um, just to get us ready uh, to pray. So um, I thought I'd fart around with my phone while I know. Uh, but um, there's a guy we've been praying for uh, who was in the hospital 42 days with COVID. 42 days. I was in a week and was uh, uh, losing it, you know. And uh, so is, uh, he was on a ventilator and God delivered him, brought him home. And then Friday, right before the service, um, I got this update from his wife, Kristen. And uh, he said, home for two weeks and down to one liter of oxygen from three. 
That's awesome. Stronger every day, walking around the house. He's so humble to know that so many people have prayed for him. Um, and then she just starts talking about how it's revolutionized their lives and the, the prayer of the people have revolutionized every part of their, just either, even their relationship. I know how that feels, by the way. I'm just like, yes, that happened to me too. And so, um, and then he's got some other challenges. We uh, he had some circulation with the, but anyways, so yay God, right? You guys prayed him out of there. And, uh, and then do you guys remember, I'm just like saying, hey, before we pray, let's just, let's just remember that God does stuff and that when we pray, stuff happens and that it's impossible for us to pray and nothing happened. It's impossible. It can't happen. You might not see it because we walk by faith and not by sight, but it's, it's impossible for us to pray. And like, we're sitting there, right? You're sitting there. You're breathing. All right. Me too. All right. So we've got other healings right here in the room that we've prayed for. And then um, there's a little, little one, a uh, uh, newborn. Do you guys remember Charlotte? We prayed. I mentioned her name several times when we've had prayer. And she was born with an infectious disease. And I, uh, um, what was it called? Hey, Jay, Jay, Jay. Oh, it's... Uh, uh, it's like when you're born, your mom has strep, and then you have something. And it's, uh, it, it's it, I mean, she was in NICU for a while. I just talked to her grandparents on a Friday night, and they said they talked to the top infectious disease person who said this is remarkable. And one of the doctors is using the word, it's a miracle. She's home. She's great. She's all good. I mean, we mentioned that name, and I mean, wow, right? So, and that's... Here, here's the deal. We prayed, God's doing stuff, and this isn't like us searching the memory banks. This is in the last few weeks, right? So I, I think <laughs> to me it's like get it while it's hot. When you're on a roll, let's 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 go. And so, uh, so are, are you good? Now here's the deal. My guess is that some of you are like, yeah, that's encouraging because I'm also going through a big thing, or my son, or my daughter, or my mom, or my dad is going through a big thing right now. And I, I know it's early in the service and stuff, and this is, can be embarrassing, and you don't have to. But if that's you, if you're like, man, I would like to be included in this prayer, would you just stand up right now? If you've got a, especially if it's a health thing, but even if it's not, if it's some other kind of thing, would you just stand up right now? And we want to pray for you, right? I'm going through a big thing. And I need my church to pray for me, all right? Okay, Terry and Julie. And I mean, Mark's near and dear to our heart. He's literally, <laughs> literally been here his whole life, right? And, uh, and uh, I mean, so, yeah, okay? All right, so here's what we're going to do, all right? So um, this might be a little much of a stretch for you. Now, look, I need you to look around. Can you guys do that? Can you look around, right? Does that mean don't look at me <laughs> right now? Look around. There's a few people in the risers. There's uh, people all over. And here's what I'm going to... You don't have to say anything. But what I'd love for you to do is find one of the people standing up. And um, I want you to go. And if it's okay with them, if you can just lay hands on their shoulders or back or something like that. There's Somebody's going to have to travel, uh, right? So we got a couple people up upstairs. Make sure there's... Come on, don't be lazy. Get up. Let's do this. We're all going to stand anyway. So uh, come on. So you're... <laughs> And some of you go, yeah, I'm not really, I don't really do this kind of thing. You know what? Why don't you do this kind of thing, <laughs> right? I'm not the kind of person that does this kind of thing. Well, why don't you start being that person, right? Here's the deal. No matter who you are, you've got something to give to that person. We've got something to give each other. And my awesome prayer that's about to get prayed, because, you know, I'm a professional and stuff, that's, that's, gonna, that's great, but you might have one word. And God, and maybe that's the word that God says, okay, there it is. There's my breakthrough word for that person. Are you ready? So we're going to pray, and we're going to pray. I don't know a lot of your other situations, so we're going to specifically pray for Mark. And if there's a word that's popping into your head to just say over that person, feel free to just say it, you know, and just say, hey, this might be from God. So are you ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. <sighs> Jesus, uh, I seem to recall that you have said that your house will be a house of prayer for all the nations. 
And so, and you said that when it wasn't, when you were turning over tables in the temple going, what you should have been doing is praying for each other and praying for the nations. And so, God, uh, message received. We want this place, this room, this, this, what's become a sacred space, a thin place for us. We want this room to be a house of prayer, a house of prayer. And so right now, we intercede for one another. Um, we just uh, speak. And just right now, if you have a word for the person on whose hand you have, just go ahead and speak that word out for them right now. If you have a sentence, or just go ahead to, just, just say it, just all over the room. Just go ahead and say it out loud to them, okay? If you don't, that's okay. Just in your heart, be holding them up, okay? In your mind, whoever you are praying for right now, can you just picture yourself like picking them up and holding them into the, in the light and warmth of God's presence? Can you just picture your mind in your brain? Just do that right now. Just hold them in the very presence of God. And just imagine, just ask, you can ask yourself some questions. Boy, holding them in the very presence of God, is there sickness there? <laughs> no. Is there cancer there? You think God likes cancer? Is there back pain? chronic and acute pain? Is there hopelessness and depression there? No. So we just come against all of that and we proclaim over this place and over these people. You can say this with me if you want. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Right there in this part of the earth that is their body as if heaven had already come and has come on them because it has. Heaven has come. So, Father, we specifically pray for our beloved friend Mark, and we just say, Mark, be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. We cut off all cancer and this leukemia. We, we banish it from his body. We pray that every treatment they're trying and doing would be wildly successful beyond what they're hoping for, beyond what their expectations are, that we would hear words from them like, wow, and remarkable, and this is, really, we don't have an explanation for why he's recovering so fast. Thank you, we've already heard words like remission, and you can go home, and so we're praying for more of that, and endurance for him, and for all of you, endurance over you. And thank you, God, that you've promised, just like that song that we sang, through trials and troubles, your love will go on. So we're counting on that. We're counting on that. And we hold each other up and pray over each other. We pray breakthrough on each other now and healing in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, just... End up back in your seat somewhere. Yeah, it's fun. I like going to church. Anybody else? Like, where else can you do this, right? You can fart around at a sports bar and watch games and hang out, but where else can you... Which, by the way, I'm saying that thinking, that sounds fun, but... Uh, yeah. Um, where else can you do this, right? Where all, I don't know. Maybe there's a place, I don't know. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad you're here. So when you came in, they gave you a, a card thing that has the uh, announcements on one side and the message thing on the other. That same outline is also on your app. And before we get started, I, I, I'm going to invite you to something real quick. You know, there's a lot of, one of the cool things about like what, what's been going on around Journey for a while now is that like ministries, um, like God moves in your hearts and stuff, you guys come up with stuff and go, you know what, we need to do this. And some of our, our biggest ministries are because you guys have said, you know what we need? We need one of these. And that's how we ended up with a food ministry. It's like it, that, it was one of you guys that said, 
hey, um, I grew up really poor and hungry and dependent on this. I, I think we need a ministry like this, and I'm, I can help us get it going. And that's how we ended up with one of those. And that's how we ended up with a thrift store is, is that. I mean, like a lot of stuff. And also, like, even churches, like Jason's church, you know, uh, it's not Jason's church, but Second Sunday, it spun out from here, right? And so one of the cool ministries that we really love is um, uh, the 2911 uh, uh, maternity home. And uh, I, it, it spun out, it's two of you, it's Mike and Becky, it's just, and, and a few other people, it's just like, hey, you know, we, this, this county, we don't have one of those. We need to, we need to empower people who are in a crisis pregnancy situation to, to be able to have whatever support they need to make a, a, a life decision and to, you know, the, the motto is save one life, transform another, or transform one life and save another. And it's like, I, I am so inspired about this. I personally, my family, we personally give to it and uh, we're happy to do so. And so here's the deal. On Tuesday night, um, we're going to have a little reception out here. We're going to have like like appetizers and all that stuff under the Atentosaurus out there and just um, be, uh, and I, so I'd love to just hang out with you then. And, and then we're going to um, give you, share some stories from that. And we'd love to inspire you. You'll be inspired. And um, we'd love to have you kind of feel like, yeah, I'm a part of Journey. I own this. And maybe, like me, uh, you'll give to it, you know, and a little or a lot, or maybe you'll pray for it, or maybe you'll just come and be inspired. I can promise you that will happen. You'll be super inspired. I've heard all the stories they're going to tell, and they're super inspiring. So anyways, that's Tuesday night at, um, I don't know, I'm here all day on Tuesdays. <laughs> I'll just stay. But is it, what is that? Six. It's at six. So I guess because, so we're going to kind of eat together and, and stuff like that. So I'd love, you're invited. So I don't even, I don't think you have to RSVP or anything. Just show up. So I'd, I'd love to have you here for that. Sound good? Yeah. It's free food. That, journey, that tends to draw people from journey. And so uh, anyways, so uh, we're start as you can see from our cool graphic and the, the video thing that seems like a distant memory now. But uh, we're starting this new series today. It's going to be four weeks. It's called Countercultural. And... Um, the, the idea of the series is we're going to take a look at some of the against the grain, the, 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 what you might call the against the grain side of Jesus, the swimming upstream, the swimming against the current side of Jesus and what he taught and said. And this, um, this is one of those series that has been in my mind and I've kind of felt the need to do it. I was on Friday, I said I wanted to do it for a year. I don't think I've wanted to do it, but I felt like we should do it for somewhere in the neighborhood of a year. It's just felt as, as the world has unfolded and become, started to become what it seems to be now. It's felt more and more necessary. And it, it's like, you're like, is this a really a good time for like against the grain, unpopular things that Jesus said? It's, and I, my answer is probably not. <laughs> and uh, um, I don't know, maybe we got, you know, too many people around here anyway. I don't know. It's like, uh, but so hopefully you won't leave. But um, uh, like, and this is going to be one of those messages with um, like a lot of like different places to stop and, and verses we're going to, that'll be on the screen or that I'll quote or I'll ask you to write down. But hopefully in the end, it'll all come together and you can watch the magic as it unfolds. But uh, so he, here's a thought I was thinking about this week. You know, Jesus, if you, if you, like, if you know anything about him and if you've, uh, if you've become familiar with the, the biblical accounts of him called the Gospels, it's one of the things that's super obvious that kind of just jumps off the page is that Jesus isn't afraid to say, you're wrong. <laughs> like, and not just to people, but to everybody. Y'all are wrong. And the way that you're wrong means this isn't going to end well for you. You're not just wrong like as in incorrect. Like you just bet on the wrong team, sports team or whatever. You're wrong in a way about some fundamental things. And if you stay wrong, it's not going to end well for you. It, it, and, and I don't want, and Jesus is kind of like, Egh. you know, it's, there's this uh, thing that 
it, there's so many places in Matthew 5 that he says this is I didn't really even have space on the slide to enumerate which verses we're talking about. But you can read the chapter if you want to see it. This form, it's almost like a formula, like a rhetorical formula Jesus has in the Sermon on the Mount. And it goes like this. You've heard it said, whatever. And then he says, but I'm telling you this, but I say to you this. For example, you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder, right? That's the Bible. So you guys think, oh, yeah, I haven't killed anybody. It's remarkable when you ask people, like, well, what do you think you're going to go to heaven? If so, why? Well, you know, I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> it's like, whoa, what an accomplishment. You know, you've, you've gone this far in life not killing somebody? You must not drive. <laughs> you know, so it's like, but, uh, you know, and Jesus says, but I say to you, if you have contempt in your heart, Maybe you haven't killed anybody, but you're part of the same problem. Here's a real popular one that Jesus laid out. You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. I assume you know what that is. Like, you're not supposed to cheat on people and have sex with people you're not married to, right? But I say to you, if you look with lust, you've already done the, you're guilty. You've, you've already crossed the line. You're already there. It's really quiet in the room right now. It's funny, uh, you know. It's remarkable how sometimes you got to like, oh, there's no time to scratch your head right now, that's for sure, right? That's like, hands on your lap, don't move. Can you even, like those of you that have some familiarity with Jesus, it's like, can you even, it's like, think about this. Jesus didn't come, like, show up starting to say, verily, verily, I say unto thee, Keep up the good work, everyone. You know, you Romans, I love what you're doing with the world. It's just awesome, you know. You guys, you have a first-class empire here. I, I like this. And all you religious leaders, great job, boys. I, I can't imagine anybody not being able to find God with what you've set up here. Awesome job. I just came to just check it out. I'm just, I'm very impressed. I mean, it, that's comical because it's like, it's almost like, what? No, of course. John the Baptist is like, yeah, well, did, did I say brood of vipers? I really meant lovable teddy bears. That's what you guys are, right? See, here's the thing. What Jesus actually shows, if you want like a one-word summary, especially in the, when Jesus shows up, the one-word summary of his message could be this, repent. Now, repent means like, uh, it means to uh, rethink. Pen, like in, uh, in French, pensoir is, is to think, right? Pensar in Spanish is to think. Repent, to think again, to rethink something. In other words, like rethink because you're going the wrong way and, and that's, things are not right. Not just for... Yeah, and, and some of them were tempted to say, yeah, look at the sinners out there. They are really bad. And Jesus like, yeah, maybe. But, I, but most of what I am saying is to those of you that, even you religious types, it's like you need to rethink everything. Things are fundamentally broken. Exhibit A. <laughs> like his followers would go on to say, like in Acts 3.15, it says, you know, here God sent Messiah. He sent Christ. He sent you know, the very embodiment of love. And here's the deal. But you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. There's one manifestation of how messed up things are, how much we need to repent. God sends love embodied, and what do we do? Kill him. Not good. And the followers of Jesus... Well, they, duh, they followed, right? That, thus the name, followers of Jesus. They followed, and they were like, they had no problem going uh, with God, even when it seemed crazy. There's one of the f guys that followed Jesus. Uh, he ended up following Jesus, a guy named Paul. He, at one point, he wrote this, for the world, for, excuse me, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God unto salvation. He says the cross is to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. In other words, and that was the two main divisions of humanity back then. Like everybody thinks this is crazy, but they were like, but we don't care because we've seen, we saw this one die and then now we saw him conquer death and be alive in our presence. 
So they were very cool with saying, like Romans 3, 4, let God be found true, though every man is a liar. What is there like, what do people say, like 8 billion people in the world today? Even if it's 7,999,999,000, like, and God is the only one, go with God. Like, even if everybody is like, uh, we think this, and God is like, no. They were, they, these early followers of Jesus are like, we're going with him. And listen, this isn't God's anger. This isn't a series about, here's some things God's really, really ticked off about. This isn't God's anger. This is God saying, do you want your best life? Do you, uh, of course you do. Like if you're raising a child, what do you want for them? You want their best life, right? Their best possible life. Do you want your best possible life? Of course you do. And this is God saying, here's how you get your best possible life. You follow me even if it's against the grain. This is how things will be and end the best for you. The Sermon on the Mount I alluded to, it closes with Jesus giving this pretty famous illustration. And he says, okay, here's, it's like this. If you listen, if you're hearing this and you ignore me and you stay with what, every, what, the, what the culture is telling you, it's like you're building your house on sand. And then when storms come, then it, it's going to be evident that you build on sand and your house will collapse. And it's a tragedy. Great is the collapse. But if you're listening to me and decide you don't care what the culture says, you're going to build your life on the things I'm telling you. It's like building your house, digging down to bedrock. And then when the storms come, your house will stand. It's not like A, it's not like if the storms come, duh, we've all lived long enough to know it's own. It's, you know, you're either in a storm or you just got out of a storm or you're waiting for the next storm. That's, uh, sadly, that's, that's our life, right? I mean, there's going to be stuff that comes. And the storms don't, it's interesting, the storms don't ruin the house. <laughs> the storms just reveal what the house so, and authentic love, like the love that God has, it lives in this place that's called reality. So Jesus is saying, this is how it will work. This is reality. So here's a logical question that you might be asking yourself or me. How did that work out for him? You know, the, the Dr. Phil question, how's that working for you? You know, uh, Jesus, how did that work out for you? Well, on the one hand... <laughs> Pretty well. He was, in his time, he was insanely popular. There's this great line in John 12, 19, where they're, you know, the people that are trying to ruin him are like, they're, they're frustrated. They keep trying stuff and it, none of it works, right? They keep trying to trap him and trick him and mess with him and, and accuse him of stuff and none of it's sticking. They even, they even send some guys to arrest him who like are, as they're making their way through the crowd, start listening to him and they, they end up standing there and they go back to the barracks or wherever they went back and they're like, where is he? Yeah, you know what? That's an interesting question. Uh, we started, I'm telling you, never has anyone spoke like this. But at one point they're, they're saying to one another, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Da, we're losing this battle. And even today, right? Today, like, by, and it's not even close, by a lot, the, the biggest, now I don't, you know, you could think this is good, bad, or indifferent. It's just a fact. By far the biggest religion, if you want to even think like that, the biggest religion in the world is the one that would name him as the central figure in the religion. Like, well, well over and growing every single day. Don't let anybody say, like, well, the church is shrinking. There's, that's imbecility. It's, it's just ignorance. It's not true. Not even, it's not even close to true. There's thousands of people every day that are making their way into this thing. And so they're well over a billion. Remember McDonald's used to have that sign, over a billion served? Like, it's like most of them, you know, my grandson, Augie, I think, so he loves his Happy Meals. But... Uh, 
so, the, the, you know, like the, with this Jesus thing, there's well, well north of a billion, billion and a half people. So it worked pretty good. But, uh, right, on the other hand, we do know how his life ends, right? And you're like, yeah, maybe it didn't work that great. And what Jesus predicts is this, if the world, this is in John 15, if the world hates you, well, here's what you should know. It hated me before it hated you. So you're in a place, you're following a guy that the world, the, in general, the culture in general decided it doesn't like. So let's think, maybe we can think about this in this way. Well, what exactly was Jesus trying to do? Right? Like, and so here's what I need you to do. If you're a, a longtime church person, or a Bible person, um, I know, you know what I do when I'm listening to somebody talk is I listen to their, what they're saying, and then I like kind of go, oh yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Oh yeah, yeah, I know that. All right. And in church, like you really do that because you're like, you, you feel like you know most of this stuff, don't you? You know, like, you know, so here's what I need you to do is just don't do that for a few minutes because what you're thinking, good chance, you're thinking this, oh yeah, I know what he's doing. He's trying to get Let's see, help people go to heaven when they die, right? That, that was the point of this. And uh, he died on the cross so you could go to heaven. Well, just hold that thought. Because really, there's what you might think of it like this. If you wanted to think <clears throat> a little more biblically, like what's actually in the Bible, you might think like this. Jesus was initiating humanity 2.0. Jesus, yes, he died, and yes, you can be forgiven, and yes, your, the future of, your, of you will change drastically if you trust Jesus and become a part of humanity 2.0. But really, like his underlying mission was to start to kind of give this humanity project, this human thing that God did in, in the creation, to give it a restart. And you could see that all through, all through the scripture, that has been God's MO. Like, you know, people are cruising around and their things are going bad. And so he selects Noah and says, okay, Noah in Hebrew. And they, he says, okay, Noah, I, I, here, we're going we're gonna to do humanity. We're going to give this thing another try. And then, of course, the big, big one is when he calls this guy named Abraham and, Abraham, and says, this, you are going to be a new, a new nation, and the rest of the world is going to get blessed by this nation, but I am going to deliberately make your people a peculiar people. I'm going to give them customs that, like, so people can just look at them and go, oh, there's a Jewish person, Right? So with Jesus, God was doing like something of a restart of humanity. In fact, the New Testament directly calls Jesus the second Adam, right? Does that make sense? And his plan, the plan of the second Adam was to, he said this, I will build my church, my ecclesia, my gathering, my group, my, my people. He's, and, and Jesus said stuff like, well, you might lose brothers and sisters over this, but there'll be something of a new family here. You might lose the favor of society and become an outcast of society. All those things happen, by the way. Um, but this will be like a new society, a culture that will be about me and my ways and my presence. Remember this thing where Jesus said, some of you will remember this, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. I'll be present in their midst. Because this thing was never about God saying, okay, I, you want to go to heaven? All right, say this prayer and you can go. I mean, that's maybe true like that, but it's, it's God saying, I'm starting new humanity. You want in? Here's how you get in. You trust Jesus. And then you get all this, you, you become part of this thing I'm doing. So Jesus came to create a Jesus culture. Well, what does that mean? Glad you asked, right? It's not unheard of for religious people to feel like they need to be uh, withdrawn from the culture at large and have their own culture, 
right? That's not an unheard of. I shouldn't say it's not unusual. It's still unusual. It's just not unheard of. Like, check these images out that we have. Like, there, there's religious people, right, that have said, hey, I, we got our own culture. And we, we're not down with you, your culture at large. Can you go back one? It's back to the Amish guys, right? And their thing, clearly they're like, you know, not that far back. Right to the Amish guys. There you go. And they're clearly like, we have our horse and our buggy and do not believe in birth control. And uh, so we've got you know, 15 kids in here with us. You know, and then, I mean, then there's less weird, right? But, they're, but clearly, go ahead. Now you can keep going on the slides. Um, you can if you want. So, uh, you know, there's like our Catholic friends. There's certain, you know, when you call, you're called to the religious life, the guys in the top right, like uh, that's a, an Orthodox community of some kind where, you, okay, you rock the beard and stuff and you do that. And then there's, if you go to Israel and you're, when you're, especially when you're in Jerusalem, you won't be able to miss the various kinds. There's a various forms of what's called ultra-Orthodox observant people, right? And usually when you think of religious culture, counterculture, whatever, typically it's around customs and observances. Like in, if you're Jewish and you're observant, what's, what's your diet called? It's called what? Kosher, right? Kosher. And then, then if you're, say, a Muslim and you want to, there's a diet that's called, anybody know what that one is? Halal diet, right? And they all have different ways that the animal has to be slaughtered and prepare and things like that. And then there's, there's ways that you dress that mark you off as distinct, especially in some cultures, for whatever reason, it seems to land mostly on the women. And then, but here's the deal. When Jesus says, I will build my culture, I will build an ecclesia, Jesus' culture is not around observances. Cultures, all cultures tend to have ways that they, um, ways they dress, what they consider appropriate, um, you know, manners, things like, you know, like in some cultures, manners are, you know, one thing and in another culture, they're slightly different. If you've traveled very much, it's not hard to know that, you know? And I remember, um, you know, like if you've ever been in Asia, what's considered a crowded subway is not what we would consider a crowded sub. We would consider, oh, man, this thing is packed. And they're like, oh, oh yeah? We'll show you, right? We'll show you what packed means, right? It's just a different deal, right? But Jesus' culture isn't like that because it's, it manifests itself in the midst of all these cultures, and like this church thing, it's funny how, how it's like viral in the very, like in before the internet sense of that word. It's like it goes somewhere and just goes, all right, this is how this looks like in Latin America. This is what this looks like in Northern Europe. This is what this looks like in Nigeria. See, Jesus' culture is not about observances, how you dress or what you eat. In fact, it kind of says we don't do that kind of stuff. If, you, if that helps you in some way, then you have at it. Even stuff like, I think this is fascinating to me. Even stuff, you would think that the gathering, that is, Jesus says, okay, you gather, you would think there would be specific things that we are mandated to do or even suggested in the gathering. And have you guys been to other churches? Of course not. You should better not. No, I'm just kidding. Go to as many as you want. We're, we're all in this together. But I mean, I'm assuming some of you have been to another church at some time, at point in your life. And it's interesting, they're, they're all somewhere between a little different than this and really different than this. There's a friend of mine that every weekend he goes to mass at eight o'clock and then he's here for journey service at 11 o'clock. And I'm guessing... I haven't been to Mass in a while, but my guess is those are pretty two different services, right? Now, here's the thing. Isn't it weird the Bible doesn't even say, okay, now your church service would look like this. Have two songs to start off. 
make sure the first one kicks butt, all right? Because uh, these people are half asleep. And then have a more mellow song. Have a guy do announcement. Which is, right? See, Jesus' culture is about, wait for it, wait a little more, all right? Jesus' culture is about, anybody want to guess? Duh, yeah, it's about Jesus, right? It's, listen, it's not about being observant and what you do. Listen, this is the weird part. Jesus' culture is about what he did. It's about him and what he did more than what we do. Wherever we, wherever we are, he can bring us back. He has the power to do that. And we are, apparently, we are valuable and God wants us back. And so what he's done is on the cross, he's taken all the evil that you've ever done and all the evil that's been done to you, and he's broken its power by absorbing it all into himself. How he's changed everything, ready? And then that can change us. So there's a gajillion, literally, there's like every page of the New Testament is kind of about, all right, Here's how we live in the Jesus culture. We live like this. We value this. This is important to us. This is, this is how we roll. This is how we treat each other. I mean, that's most of the New Testament. But here's one place that is kind of explicit about what the Jesus culture is and what God's doing. It's Ephesians 2. It's on your outline. It'll be on the screen. But I'm going to read a few verses that kind of roll into it, right? It says, for in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, we are, we are the workmanship of God. This is God doing art. This is God, you know, sculpting. This is God doing something that's going to be awesome. Therefore, remember that formerly you, that's most of us, you Gentiles, you non-Jewish people in the flesh who are sometimes called the uncircumcision. If you're going like, I'm, I don't really know what that means. Ask your mom. All right, uh, this is, this is PG-13, no higher here. So by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. It's just, it's a human thing done by humans to humans. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. You were an outsider in the people of God, right? Are you with me? With outsider, with excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to all of God's covenants and promises, and that left you without hope, without God in the world. Sucks to be us, right? But now, whew, I'm glad there's a but now in there. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The blood, the very blood of his son brought us near. Now the part that's on your outline. For he himself, this Jesus Character himself is our shalom, our peace. He has given you peace with God. Romans 5 1 is a great place to look for that. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And the peace of God, peace from God, and peace with each other. For he himself is our shalom, our peace. And here's what he did he made both groups into one. And broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. The mesatoikon is the Greek word. If you're going, that's a word I should know. No, well, only if it's a really rare word. It's only used here in the New Testament. And it's uh, used a little bit, not out there in the, in the Greek world, but it was used a little bit in the Greek-speaking Jewish world. And what it referred to, a mesatoikon, was a wall, all right, but it was, a, it was a specific wall. It was the wall if you were making your way through the temple. And the temple complex, it's where the al Aqsar Mosque is today. And uh, that, 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 that whole thing, talk about needing peace, that whole scene. It's this huge, huge space in the middle of Jerusalem. And you walk in there, and here's what it would have looked like is there was the big courtyard that was like the everybody courtyard. Anybody could come and seek the God of Israel. But there was a mesastoikon. There was this wall, this barrier, and, and it was, say, this high. And, and they found the, a piece of it. 
This is the closest thing we have the actual piece of the temple. And, on the, and it's written in Greek. I should show you, I should have got a slide and showed you a picture of it. But there's a, it's written in Greek, and, it's, and when you translate it, it says this. Here's this inscription on the Mesa Stoikon on the wall. It says, no foreigner may enter within the balustrade around this sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught on himself shall be put blame for the death which will ensue. In other words, if you... If you're a non-Jew and you walked through the, with, through the court of the Gentiles into the court of the Jews and crossed the Mesozoikon, they would kill you. The Romans were cool with that one, by the way. They said, yeah, go ahead and kill people to do that. Romans weren't killing people. <laughs> it wasn't that big a deal to them. Then next, listen to the next verse. By, here's what he did. By a, so he's made the two into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, he says, by abolishing through his body the enmity, that thing that is, that thing that is in you that when you're born that's, that resents God, that's hostile to God and a little bit hostile to everybody else. That thing that, that when people have stood in front of you, you're like, well, did you just, just, why are you? That thing, that enmity, he has abolished that. He's defanged that which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, all the, the dogmas and things that separate people. He says, so that in himself, here's, this, is the, this is the big deal, right? So that in Jesus, in himself, Jesus might do this. He might make, the word there is taste, it means to create. So we're going all the way back to humanity, to point out, that he might make the two into one new anthropos, one new, one kine anthropon, one new humanity. He's making a new humanity, humanity 2.0, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by the cross having put to death that enmity. Now, that passage, we could do another three messages on that. But for now, here's the idea. Cultures have their own worldviews and values and ways that people relate. And as Jesus' culture manifests itself in different places and cultures, like the, the way that it goes looks differently. But here's a few of the like universals. This isn't, there's like, this list could be super long. But here's a few that we're going to just show you real quick. The world culture versus the Jesus culture. You might want to take a picture of this if you, with your phone. The world culture is a domination system. We talked about this two weeks ago. The Jesus culture is a love system. It's driven by love. Listen, because God has great confidence in his love, in its catalytic power and force. See, we think God is like being kind of like soft by saying, you know, I, I, I'm all about love, you know. And you're like, yeah, well, if you're really tough, you'd be. God's like, you don't understand. My, I am love. I created this thing. So I, here's the cool thing about God. God has a lot of faith in God. His faith level in himself is sky high. So we don't have to dominate. We can just love. Romans 12, 2 says that, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Good catch from Friday. So that you may prove what the will of God is. You could prove, you could show what this new humanity is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Notice that this is not about, and this is the next thing on that little schema there. This the world is about a conformity, and Jesus' culture is about transforming. So here's the deal. When this, this is why at Journey, you go, um, why don't we like put out there and initially, we think this, we have this opinion about that. Here's about these issues. We all tend to think this. Um, politically, we're, here's where we're at. Here's why we don't do that, because this is not about conformity. It's about transforming. You transform, and then those other things 
tend to line up. The world is about image and image management. The world culture, the Jesus culture is about authenticity. Our friend John Lynch says, I love the way he says this, in the Jesus culture, it's more important that nothing is hidden than that anything gets fixed. You might want to silence that. Um, it, 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 uh, might not, I don't know, either way. Um, but uh, in, in the Jesus culture, it's more important that nothing is hidden. And here's the other thing, the main thing. In the world culture, it's, a, it's disconnected from God. The Jesus culture is all about connection. Connection changes everything. It changes everything. And here's the deal. When you're disconnected and when you, or whether you're connected, what that shapes is what stuff means. It's about meaning. See, how do you know what stuff means? Are we just making this up? Are we on our own? So, when you do a message like this, one of the questions you ask yourself is, what good does this do anybody? <laughs> like, right? This, of course, this is fascinating and interesting, but like, what, what does it actually do for us? And here's what I think it's doing for us, is it's clarifying what it really looks like to be a follower of Jesus. And what this Jesus, what's the point of Jesus culture? Why, why is God remaking humanity? And why does he insist that we're a part of something big and that that, that thing might be countercultural? Why is he saying this to us? Let me make it clear one more time. That Jesus insists, he insists that he and he alone can give you your best life. Because if you lose him, you lose God. And if you lose God, you've lost all. And you are now in the house on the sand scenario. Because storms will come. Dang it, I wish that wasn't true. I hate storms. Don't you hate storms? I wish they didn't come. But they keep coming. And here's the deal. They will expose what we're doing, like if we're building on rock or not. So here's four closing points that I think are, are going to be, I don't know, I think they're going to be helpful. Ready? Think about this. Societies can move along a continuum or a spectrum of reaction to Jesus and Jesus culture. This is how I'm trying to help you go, what are you talking about with Jesus culture? See, we live within a culture, and we're a part of this. Like, we think like Americans, we think like Californians, we think like people that live in Southern California. There's, there's a whole culture. There's a diff I grew up in Orange County. There's a different culture here in San Diego than there is in Orange County. It's a culture of superior Mexican food, for one, and uh, <laughs> it goes from there, right? But here's the thing is the Jesus culture, which is a, again, and, and it's in sometimes against the grain, right? Like, a, your culture will, can move like this, from active support to neutrality. And, there's, and you realize there's, there's 10,000 gradations between each of these, right? From active support, like the culture can say, I love what you guys are doing. How can we help you? Let's, in fact, let's fund you. Like in some like European countries, there's the state pays for the church, right? That's, that's a bad idea, but they do that. And from active support to neutrality to tolerance, hey, look, do whatever you want. We let everybody do what we want. Oh, we're not saying anything good, bad, or indifferent. In fact, we're kind of a don't love what you're doing, but whatever. To mild hostility to full-on persecution. And if you think, yeah, I've heard that back in the Bible days, they had the persecution. No, back in the now days, they have persecution. I was with a man on, on Tuesday night, not 10 years ago or 1,000 years ago, on Tuesday, who was in Iraq. And he, his friend, he's a teenager, his friend becomes a Christian. 
and starts and lets him know that he's become a, a Christian and says, would you like to read the Bible with me? And he's like, oh, no. And this, actually, I take it back. They're not from Iraq. They're from Egypt. They're from the town that the Muslim Brotherhood started in. And he said, while they're reading the Bible together in his friend's living room, he sees Jesus standing behind his friends. He's like, just sees, he has his vision. And he's like, ah, and says, and kind of decides, I better become a Christian. Over the next couple of years, here, I'll just get to the part of his story. He's in jail, he's like 20, and he's beaten so badly that they think they've killed him. So they throw him out on the street. And fortunately, a taxi drives by that happens to be a friend of his dad's, recognizes him, throws him in the car and takes him home and he lives. Th that's like nowadays, right? So you're thinking, yeah, we don't have that. Well, you can try to figure out where our culture is on this. But let me just, I don't know, let me ask you this and just see what your reaction is. Which of these, it, it, like, and I, I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer here, but we'll see if you get it right. Um, which, which of these is the one that Jesus kind of conditioned us to expect. Yeah, somewhere, if, if this was laid out left to right, kind of towards the right side, we should kind of ex expect to kind of cruise around there, right? Here, let me give you a couple more quick points. Um, here's, let me say one more thing. One of the reasons I feel like, I think we need to do some messages on this, is it, and I, this is totally, I could be wrong on this. But um, it feels to me and seems what I can discern that our, our culture is moving in the last year or two. Like to, to, the, to, to a side that I don't appreciate. Seems like that to me. Like in the last five years or so. I don't know, just, just a thought. I, I, I'd love to be wrong on that. Number two, the problem for the world culture is with authentic followers of Jesus. If you want to avoid any of these hassles and anything like persecution or even mild hostility, then just be like a lot of people. Like in some ways, you're like, well, yeah, sure, I believe in Jesus. Sure, yeah, why not? Mm-hmm, yep, love him, good. I, I, when I, I got baptized t 10 years ago, it was great. But the people the world has a problem with are those that are authentically following Jesus, that are letting it affect their life. Number three, meaning, reality, is a revealed thing, which is why those of us that are followers of Jesus cling to the Bible, right? So here's a hint. Try reading the Bible. Like for those of us that are followers of Jesus, for you to keep following Jesus, you're going to have to read the Bible more than, get, you're going to need more Bible than what I can give you in the very brief sermon that you uh, get every week. You're just going to need more. And then number four, is this culture, it should be noted, is cross-shaped. It's shaped like the cross. L listen to this. Jesus' culture only works because of the cross. It only works because of the cross. He has made it possible. He has defeated evil and opened the way back to God. When you trust Christ... You become one with Jesus in such a way that where you start and he begins, it, it's like you're so fused with him that everything he is, you start to become. You might not dress or look any differently, but eventually it comes out that you're going to start looking like Jesus. So, here's the deal. Here's the last idea. In spite of the cost, whatever cost there might be and whatever cost might be coming, 
we have Jesus' promise and his word that it'll be worth it because this, this, Jesus says, is how you get your best life, both now and later. So let's, let's pray. If you've never trusted Jesus, if you've never become part of Humanity 2.0, we invite you in. Jesus, and better than that, Jesus invites you in. He invites you to trust him and to become part of this new thing that he's doing, this beautiful thing that he's doing. And here's the cool part, is it really doesn't, it doesn't matter where you've been and how far you are from him. He has an amazing ability to find people and rescue them and transform them. He has such ability that he says, listen, what I need from you is for you to trust me, for you to open up your life and let me in. I don't need you to make promises about how you're going to clean up your act and do things differently and all that. I need you to change your mind about me and trust me, and then we'll go from there. If you're willing to do that, Jesus will come into your life. It, how I did that is I prayed a prayer and I said, all right, Jesus, you can even use this exact prayer if you want. I said, I need you. I recognize that I've sinned, but I believe that you died on the cross for me, that you rose from the dead and that that can change everything. So come into my life. It was about that complicated, and that began to change my life, and it will change yours. So as we worship this Jesus, because it's really, it centers around him, let's just exalt him. Let's give thanks. Let's put our faith in him that he will lead us to have a life it looks like a house built on rock. Why don't you stand up right now as we worship? And before I, you can grab this. Before I uh, get off the stage, um, Aaron, our drummer, did there. It's kind of dark up here. Sadly, Aaron is moving to Colorado. He's been faithfully serving back here, and so um, get really good at clapping along because he's not going to be here, right? So uh, let's. Let's thank Aaron for leading us in worship so many times. We love you, man. We love you so much.
guys so don't forget next week we have the blood drive for mark please don't forget that um and uh, also if you guys need prayer we got our prayer team over there other than that we'll see you guys next week we love you guys